Hello everyone. Let's get started. Today we're going to be discussing antimicrobial drugs. By definition, an antimicrobial drug is a compound that can kill or control the growth of microorganisms, both in and on the surface of the body. There are different types of antimicrobial drugs for different types of microbes, and it's important that we distinguish one from the other. So there are some antimicrobials that are antibacterial, there are some that are antiviral, and some that are antifungal. We're going to stay focused on antibacterial compounds in this lecture. When we talk about antimicrobial drugs, it's important that we keep in mind the source of these drugs. And they are generally sourced from three different groups. The first are the synthetic antimicrobials. So these are drugs that are 100% man-made, and they can target various types of microbes. Then there are the antibiotics. An antibiotic, by definition, is a compound that occurs in nature. It's produced by a living organism. It protects one microbe against an attack by another microbe. We then harvest the antibiotic from these living cells and use it for our own purposes. The third category are called the semi-synthetics. And a semi-synthetic compound is an antibiotic, again, a natural compound, that has been taken into the laboratory and had adjustments made to it. It's been modified to make it a drug that better suits our needs. Regardless of the category of drug, all antimicrobial drugs have to be selectively toxic. And what we mean by this is they have to have their effect on the microbe without doing serious harm to the host, to the person who is taking the drug. Now, it's important to note that all drugs, including antimicrobial drugs, have side effects. So it's not that these drugs don't do anything bad to the person who takes them. There are side effects associated with antimicrobial drugs, and you may have experienced some of these side effects yourself. You may have experienced, for example, nausea or diarrhea or even vomiting. Um, some people are particularly sensitive to these side effects. But the idea is that these drugs are toxic to the pathogen without being toxic to the host. So cell wall inhibitor type antimicrobial drugs target peptidoglycan synthesis. This is a selective toxicity. It's selective because human cells don't have peptidoglycan. So the drug harms only cells that have this particular molecule in them. Another example is the class of antimicrobials called translation inhibitors. Now, they target a particular form of a ribosome. They target the bacterial form of a ribosome. So the 30S small subunit and the 50S large subunit of the bacterial ribosome. The reason that these drugs don't harm uh, human ribosomes is because our ribosomes are just different enough that the drugs don't affect them. We have a 40S small subunit and a 60S large subunit in our ribosomes. Selective toxicity. So we're going to begin by talking about the synthetic antimicrobials. There are two broad categories of these types of antimicrobial drugs. Remember, these are synthetic, which means we produce these in the laboratory 100%. These include growth factor analogs and what are known as the quinolones. Now, growth factor analogs can actually be a variety of types. They can be antibacterial, they can be antifungal, 
and they can be antiviral depending on the drug. But again, we're going to stay focused on the antibacterial type today. The quinolones are only antibacterial. So in order to understand how a growth factor analog works, we first have to understand what a growth factor is. And growth factors are naturally occurring molecules that are actually required by the microbe. In other words, they can't be made by the microbe cell. They have to be uh, taken in from an outside source. So growth factors are perfectly natural molecules and microbial cells have to obtain them from the environment, have to take them in, and then use them for some metabolic process. A growth factor analog is simply a synthetic molecule that looks a lot like a natural growth factor, but doesn't function the same way. So they're very similar in structure to the natural growth factor, but they have slight modifications made to them that makes them unable to function like the actual growth factor. So a growth factor analog will be taken in by a microbial cell, but it simply can't function the way the natural growth factor does. And what ends up happening is the microbial cell experiences a disruption in its met metabolic pathways because this molecule doesn't work for them. And that will either, again, restrict their growth, their ability to divide, in other words, or, or it will kill them outright. So let's take a look at some examples of growth factor analogs. The sulfa drugs were actually the first widely applied growth factor analog that was antibacterial in its activity. Sulfa antimicrobials were first discovered during a time when um, we were looking for anti-streptococcal drugs for medicine. Um, the original example, the original drug that was used was called sulfanilamide. And sulfanilamide is actually a growth factor analog that um, mimics a molecule called PABA. Now PABA stands for P-aminobenzoic acid. Uh, now you know why everybody calls it PABA. Um, PABA is actually part of folic acid, and folic acid is simply one of the B vitamins. Folic acid is required uh, by microbial cells to produce nucleic acids, to produce DNA and RNA. So this PABA analog looks a lot like the actual PABA molecule. It just has slight structural modifications made to it in the laboratory. And when a microbial cell takes it in, when a microbial cell takes in sulfanilamide from the environment, it will use it the way it would use PABA, or it tries to anyway. It ends up then having an abnormal pathway of folic acid synthesis. It can't make folic acid, and therefore it can't synthesize any new nucleic acid. So this is um, the way all of the growth factor analogs work. They interfere with normal metabolic pathways. Now, sulfanilamide has selective toxicity, as all antimicrobials must have. And that's because while bacteria have to synthesize their folic acid, and so they need PABA to do that process, human beings don't make their folic acid. Human beings actually consume their folic acid in the diet. So this growth factor analog doesn't affect human cells the way it would affect bacterial cells. So sulfanilamide was a real breakthrough when it was introduced. Um, unfortunately, as with all antimicrobial drugs, the more we use them, the more we see resistance develop in the microbe. So sulfanilamide uh, started to show signs that um, the microbes were becoming resistant to it. 
and that led for us to a search for additional sulfa type drugs. Um, interestingly enough, the way the bacteria became resistant, some bacteria became resistant to sulfonilamide, was that they mutated to form a resistance type of protein. And what this protein does in bacteria that are resistant to this drug is it allows them to take up folic acid from the environment intact. In other words, bacteria that are resistant to sulfonilamide don't need PABA anymore because they just take the whole folic acid molecule in from the environment and use that instead. So after the problem of resistance to sulfonilamide was recognized, um, a drug called trimethoprim was developed. Trimethoprim also interferes with the folic acid synthesis pathway. It just interferes with a different step in that pathway. And interestingly, uh, trimethoprim is still a widely used antimicrobial drug. Um, it's particularly popular in combination with other drugs. So um, there are commercially available combinations of sulfa drugs mixed together with trimethoprim that are still uh, widely used in medicine. And you've probably heard of some of these. These are drugs um, that go by the, the trade names of Bactrim and Septra. Um, you may have even taken one of these drugs before. Now, another growth factor analog that we need to be familiar with is one called isoniazid. Isoniazid is an interesting antimicrobial because it specifically targets mycobacteria. So this is a, a, an antimicrobial that um, works against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the organism that causes TB. Isoniazid is actually an analog of a different growth factor, one called nicotinamide. And nicotinamide is used in a pathway to build a molecule called mycolic acid. And if you recall, mycolic acid is that waxy material that mycobacteria secrete around the outside of themselves. It's mycolic acid that interferes with the gram staining procedure and makes it so that we can't gram stain mycobacteria. So mycolic acid is synthesized in these mycobacterial cells and um, nicotinamide is required for that synthesis. Isoniazid is an analog of nicotinamide. The mycobacteria take the isoniazid in, they try to use it as nicotinamide, but it doesn't work, so they can't make mycolic acid correctly. Isoniazid is actually still quite effective against most strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis, but because we have um, a problem of increasing resistance in these organisms, um, it's often combined with another drug called rifampin. Now, rifampin works completely differently. Rifampin uh, stops the production of RNA from DNA. So remember from the central dogma, that's the process of transcription. Rifampin interferes with transcription in bacteria. Now, one of the issues with rifampin is that it has terrible side effects. Um, this is not a drug you would want to take unless you absolutely had to. But when you combine isoniazid and rifampin, you get a very good effect against um, the organism that causes tuberculosis. You, get, you hit these cells, these microbe cells, in two ways. You prevent them from making mycolic acid, and you prevent them from doing transcription normally. When the two drugs are combined, a patient who is being treated for tuberculosis can be treated for a shorter period of time, which is nice, 
And we've seen that the combination of drugs helps slow the development of resistance in the bacteria. So those are the growth factor analogs that I want us to be familiar with. Next, I want to say just a few words about the quinolones. Remember, quinolones are all antibacterial, but they are not antibiotic, remember, because antibiotics come from living cells. The quinolones are synthetic drugs. They are made in the laboratory. Now, the way the quinolones function is they interfere with topoisomerase enzymes. And topoisomerase enzymes are required for the normal folding process of the nucleoid in bacterial cells. Remember, the chromosome wraps around histone-like proteins, and we get a sort of a stacking and a folding and a compaction of the DNA molecule inside bacterial cells to create what we call the nucleoid. Topoisomerase enzymes are critical for that process. And if um, a quinolone is administered, these enzymes can't do the work that they need to do, and the nucleoid does not get folded correctly. Now, you may have heard of some of the quinolone antimicrobials. You may have heard of um, a drug called Cipro, uh, which is short for ciprofloxacin. There's one called Leviquin. There's one called Ocuflox, which is an ophthalmic drug. Um, quinolones are fairly widely prescribed.